ओम स्थापकाय चतुर्म सेमस्वरूपिणी अवतार वरिष्ठा राम कृष्णा के So we'll be continuing our discussion on the Purva Mimamsa philosophy, just an introduction. So today it will be the last discussion on this topic. We have covered a lot of ground. Mimamsa we have seen it means attempts at rational inquiry. So what is being inquired here? it is being inquired as to what the vedas want to say what is the import of the vedas and what is the nature of dharma uh, we have seen how the vedas are considered eternal and infallible and how words and their relation to their meanings are also considered to be eternal because they are all manifestations of a primary word and as regards mimamsa theory of knowledge we had discussed a little of only one of them shabda pramana or verbal cognition because that is the most important here as they have to prove that knowledge which is revealed by the vedas is self valid it does not have to be proved by any other knowledge that is the doctrine of swata pramanyavad or validity of self knowledge which we have discussed in detail so last time we had uh, discussed in a very brief way mimamsa metaphysics that the world is composed of living bodies the sensory and motor organs the objects which constitute the fruits to be enjoyed or suffered and of course we they don't believe in any god hmm. they say that the law of apurva is sufficient the law of karma is sufficient to guide the universe so we had seen the concepts of shakti and apurva last time what is shakti each cause possesses an imperceptible power which enables it to produce its effect and if that power is destroyed that effect is cannot that that effect cannot be produced and one important application of this theory of shakti or potency is the concept of apurva so i'll just to recapitulate i'll just share the image you can see here apurva acts are enjoyed enjoyed with a view to their fruits that means when the vedas tell us to do something they will tell that if you do this you will get this <coughs> and there has to be a connection between an action and its result otherwise how can one action produce some result there has to be a connection so they say that if you perform vedic sacrifices today you will get the results not immediately but after many years or maybe even after death so there has to be a connection otherwise how can we uh, get the results after death when we perform something here hmm. 
so there is an unseen force which connects the acts which we do today and the results which we get at a future date that unseen force is called a purva so next point you can see since sacrifices and the like are laid down for the purpose of definite results to follow after a long time this deferred fruition of the action is not possible unless it is through the medium of apurva so apurva is the metaphysical link between the work and its result karma and its phala that is the thing and we had seen last time that the mimamsakas are unwilling to trace the results of actions to any god hmm. they don't admit the necessity of god at all <clears throat> so today we will just discuss what is the mimamsakas view about first the soul behind the body is the soul we all know so what is the nature of the soul according to mimamsaka second what do they say about liberation and third is how they deny the existence of god so the arguments they did give that to show that there is no god those are quite interesting we will see that hmm. first just a few words about what is their view of the soul soul or the atman which is called so soul according to mimamsakas also is eternal hmm. soul was never born it will never die and it is infinite and of course the soul is related to a body the body is real the world is real and of course the soul survives the body after death the body will be either burnt or buried or something but the soul will not be destroyed when we die the soul will leave the body and reap the consequences of all the good things or bad things it has done so that is the thing this all these things are also admitted admitted by advaita vedanta to some extent not everything but the main point where swami mimamsaka's conception of the soul differs from vedanta is that mimamsakas say that consciousness is not the essence of the soul consciousness is not its essence then how does the soul become conscious according to mimamsakas it says that the soul becomes conscious when some conditions are present otherwise the soul by its nature is not consciousness at all here we know that it differs from vedanta because vedanta says that soul is of the nature of consciousness sat chit that chit means consciousness but mimamsaka say no consciousness consciousness is not the essence of the soul and they say that in dreamless sleep that is called sushupti and when the soul is liberated they say that the soul has no consciousness so how does consciousness become generated in the soul according to mimamsakas they say that when there is a relation between our sense organs and any object when we perceive something then consciousness is generated in the soul how we don't really know they have not really explained so they say that at the time of dreamless sleep there is no sense organs when functioning there is no object in front of you 
and in liberation also you are out of, outside of the body so there are no objects hmm. so they say that in liberation and as well as in dreamless sleep the conditions required for the generation of that consciousness are absent hmm. so the soul is without consciousness in those states that is the peculiar view then of course they say that there are as many souls as there are individuals hmm. each person has a different soul which reaps different results after death hmm. and the souls are subject to bondage as well as liberation the soul will become bound when in the body then outside the body if it attains liberation it will become liberated hmm. so these in short are the view of the mimansakas as regards the soul and of course they also say that the soul is not ananda hmm, by itself it is not bliss as vedanta says sat chit ananda so they say that soul is neither knowledge nor bliss all these are generated in the soul by its energy and the operation of the sense organs so when at the time of liberation etc the soul is uh, rid of the sense organ so there is no consciousness in the soul no bliss nothing salvation when is salvation brought about salvation is brought brought about when a man enjoys and suffers the fruits of his good and bad actions hmm. so they say that we are all bound by our actions good as well as bad so when we enjoy the good actions suppose i have got i have done some good thing hmm. as a result i get some ice cream so i eat the ice cream and maybe i have done some bad action so i get a stomach ache or headache or something so i suffer when i get that so my good karmas are exhausted by the enjoyment and the bad karmas are exhausted by the suffering they say that because in this way we enjoy and suffer when we have by enjoyment when we have exhausted all the good karma and when by suffering we have exhausted all the bad karma then the soul is liberated hmm. and how does the soul prevent the generation of new karma they say that <clears throat> they say if you perform nitya karma nitya karma means sandhya vandana hmm. and uh, you know in ancient india there used to be a sacrificial fire in each home hmm, where they used to do daily sacrifices pancha yagya all that so they say that when you perform nitya karma regularly without desiring anything then what will happen the evil deeds which you have per- performed earlier will all be exhausted hmm so nitya karma if you do there is no positive effect but if you don't do there will be sin so if you do keep on doing nitya karma then all the evil effects of your action will be exhausted and of course the good effects will be exhausted by enjoying the whatever you get so so good and evil both are exhausted when that happens you get liberation that is their view so one thing we should note that in the original mimamsa sutras jaimini and the commentary upon that by shabara swami they have no conception of moksha at all there is nothing known as liberation and that is logical because they say that the aim of human life is action and vedas enjoy an action 
So why do why should they propound liberation at all? It makes no sense. So they say that you give have birth, do dharma, do Vedic sacrifices, go to heaven, enjoy, come again, again do sacrifices, no problem at all according to them. So this conception of liberation has come later by Prabhakara and Kumarila Bhatta. Hmm. That is the thing. So this we should remember that in the original sutras and the original commentary by Shabara Swami, there is no concept of liberation or moksha at all. So Prabhakara and Kumarila Bhatta, they bring this conception of liberation. And Prabhakara also describes heaven, Swarga. What is heaven? Prabhakara says that it is unalloyed bliss, unmixed bliss, free from pain, which of course we all want. And he also says that what is then liberation? If heaven is unalloyed bliss, what is liberation? So liberation, he says, is the complete disappearance of Papa and Punya means merit and demerit because if Papa and Punya both are not destroyed then before that the soul cannot be rid of this body. How can we be rid of the body? Because if there is a good merit left then we need a body to enjoy it. We can't eat ice cream without a body. Hmm. And if some bad deed is there, we have to get a stomach pain. So we have to have a body, no, to get that stomach pain. So till all the results of karma are nullified, there is no end to this body business. So Prabhakara says, when the merit and demerit, everything is exhausted, then there is no body. We don't adopt any new body. So we get liberated. And what is liberation according to him? Final release or liberation is complete cessation of pain of empirical life. There is no pain. When we be liberated, there is no pain. But remember, there is no joy also according to him. Because ananda is not a feature of the soul. Hmm. So... Liberation is due to complete destruction of the self's contact with the body and the sense organs. The body and the senses are destroyed by the complete disappearance of merit and demerit. Hmm. That is the thing. This we should remember. So we have seen that according to them, consciousness is not a <coughs> uh, property of the self as Vedanta says. Hmm. So, total extinction of all consciousness. That is the concept of liberation. The soul exists in its pure essence without any empirical contents. Knowing, feeling, willing, impressions, everything goes when we are liberated. The soul exists in its natural condition devoid of punya and papa. So liberation according to Mimansakas is purely negative. Hmm. It is a big zero. There is nothing. So uh, I don't know how really it differs from uh, Shunyavada. Hmm. It is more or less uh, the same thing because there is nothing. The soul is there they say but what is the use of having a soul when you have no consciousness or no bliss at all? So it is only destruction. Liberation is a state of only destruction. Nothing remains. And this is what the Nayaikas also say. The Nyaya philosophy, they also say that liberation is the total destruction of all the qualities. Hmm like cognition, pleasure, pain, desire, aversion, etc. So, both the Nayaikas, that is followers of Nyaya and followers of Mimansa, they hold that liberation is a not a state of bliss, 
it is a negative state of absolute extinction of pain hmm. that is the thing so this is a very strange concept and it is difficult to imagine why such a state would be covetable hmm. yeah so there you have no consciousness you have no bliss hmm. so uh, how do they justify that we should strive for liberation and if they say that heaven is the state of anal unalloyed bliss so it is far better to go to heaven no at least you have some joy there maybe we can get some ice creams and all that but in liberation there is no chance yeah so this is the thing and now we come to the today's discussion is a very short one so we will come to the final part that is god hmm. i have kept a little detailed discussion because it is interesting to note how through logic they try to deny the existence of god and as i have told you that in philosophy the fun is that when some view point is put by a section of philosophers you feel that this must be true this sounds so logical so when they give arguments against the existence of god we will see that it seems wow how can those arguments be contradicted there cannot be any god so let's see so first of all again there is a difference between the original sutras and the views of prabhakara and kumarila original jaimini sutras does not even refer to god like it does not refer to liberation god is not even mentioned okay but later prabhakara and kumarila they deny the existence of god as the creator and preserver of the universe which is held by nearly all other indian schools of course except charvaka and all that so other schools hold that it is god who creates everything god preserves the world then god destroys it but they say mimamsaka says there is no need of god law of karma is sufficient hmm. that is enough to guide the world so they do not believe in god existence of any type of god as the creator of the world or the distributor of karma <clears throat> hmm. that god gives us fruits of our actions we believe that generally but they say no god does not do anything it is all law of karma which acts automatically that is the thing so <clears throat> and of course the vedic deities also indra varuna mitra all those were vedic deities <clears throat> so when we do some any vedic yagya we say indra ya swaha varuna ya swaha all that but mimamsaka say that these deities are not objects of worship they are not gods <clears throat> they are just beings maybe more exalted than us they are just beings to whom we offer sacrifices that is all hmm. they do not give us the results of the sacrifices hmm. they do not make the sacrifices generate their result hmm. so one view is that those god exist nowhere except in the vedic mantras that is all outside the mantras those gods have no existence at all they have no function in the universe that is what they say hmm. so this is their view point now let us come to the arguments which they give against the existence of god hmm. so let us come to prabhakara as as i have told you the original sutras don't mention anything but later prabhakara and kumarila they argue against the existence of god so what does prabhakara say hmm. prabhakara argues that there is no evidence for the creation or the destruction of the whole world hmm. we think we say that the whole world is created the whole world is destroyed 
He says there is no evidence of that at all. They say that all the finite things are composed of parts. They are created by the conjunction of the parts. How to build a house? Now bring all the things necessary, join them, the house will be built. And when the parts are again separated, when a bulldozer comes and smashes the house, then all the disintegration, so the parts go back to their original state. That is the thing. So they say that all these things, finite things, they come into existence gradually. One day this house, earlier this house was not there. Then we combined all the parts. And after some years, what will happen? When the parts are decayed, they will disintegrate and the house again will no longer be there. So all these things come into existence gradually and pass away gradually. So where is the need of God? No need. Hmm. Uh, then they say that how are animals and human beings born? They said that they are born of their parents. How does God come into that? Hmm. So all things in the world according to them are produced by the causes. There is a cause and effect. They don't owe their existence to God. All effects are due to natural causes. That's all. No supernatural cause is necessary to explain them. How does the tree grow from the seed? The seed gets food from the soil and the tree grows. That's all. So why do you need a God? So Nyaya Vaisheshika argue that God is the supervisor of merit and demerit. God gives us Punya and Papa, merit and demerit. But <clears throat> Mimansakas don't believe that. So Nayaikas say that Punya and Papa, merit and demerit are unconscious. So if they are unconscious, how can they bring about their result without the guidance of someone who is conscious? That is the Nayaikas what they say. We say that good karma produces good result. Bad karma produces bad result. So, Nayaika say that karma is not conscious. So, without some conscious being behind, hmm, how is the effect of karma distributed? So, there must be a God who is endowed with intelligence. Hmm. That is what the Nayaika say, that the body is also not conscious. Hmm. The mind is also not conscious. So how this karma is distributed? But of course, Mimansakas don't agree. Prabhakara says that God cannot be the supervisor of the universe. God does not supervise the origin of things by combination of atoms. Why? Simple argument. They say that God has no motive. We act why? Any action we do, there has to be some motive. If we eat, why? We feel hungry. We don't do something without any motive. So Mimansaka say, you say that God created the universe. Why? God has no motive. Nayaikas say that God creates the world out of atoms as a carpenter creates a table out of wood. There is wood, raw, raw form, carpenter, what does he do? What does he do? He uh, fashions the wood, maybe scrapes it, joins it, he creates a table. Similarly, God also creates the world from all these different things. Now, Prabhakara, that is Mimansaka, they say that if you say that God creates the world like a carpenter creates a table from the wood, then you are saying that God also has a body like the carpenter. 
कारपेंटर इज द बॉडी नो अदरवाइज हाउ कैन यू क्रिएट टेबल फ्रॉम द बॉडी वर्ड्स सो मीमांसक से दिस मीन्स दैट गॉड ऑल्सो हैज अ बॉडी लाइक अ कारपेंटर बट विथ दैट टाइप ऑफ बॉडी हाउ कैन गॉड एक्ट अपॉन सच सटल थिंग्स लाइक एटम्स और पुण्य एंड पाप दोज आर वेरी सटल थिंग्स आउटसाइड द रेंज ऑफ द सेंसेज इफ गॉड हैज अ बॉडी how can he act upon those subtle things hmm. and even if suppose he could act upon those subtle things if god has a body who created god's body who created god's body if you say some other god then it will be infinite circle who created that god's body hmm. so god cannot have a body again body is due to our merit and demerit only we have done some good work we have to get the result we have done some bad work we have to suffer the consequences so we need a body for that but why does god need a body he has not done anything good he has not done anything bad so god is devoid of merit and demerit so he cannot have a body and if we did have a body who created that body there is no other creator you say so if god is the creator of a world he must have a body and he cannot have desire to create without a body why because desire is due to the contact of the soul with the mind and body see if the soul they say that mimansakas what did they say we had we had seen that the mimansakas say that consciousness is generated in the soul when it con- comes in contact with the sense organs etc hmm. so desire can only arise when the soul is in contact with the mind and body otherwise desire cannot come so how does god create the world without any desire because if he has to create a world he must have a desire and desire cannot arise without a body and god cannot have a body because if he has a body who created that body it could not have been created by himself hmm he cannot create his own body so we must postulate another creator of his body and that is goes in a circle ad infinitum that is called so we cannot locate the source of the first body and if the body body of god is eternal if you say the god has a body and god created the universe and you say that god is eternal now if the body of god is eternal it cannot be material substance because all material substances are subject to origin and destruction okay so if you say that the body of god is eternal that body could not be any material substance because there is no material substance in the world in the universe which is not subject to destruction so if you say god has a body of material substance then one day god will also die because the body will disintegrate hmm. so you say that there is a god so his body must be either eternal or transient see the logic if god has a body there can be only two option that body has to be either eternal or transient means the body either it is there for all time to come or it will disintegrate one day there can be only two options they say that if the god has a body it cannot be eternal because like a carpenter 
the body of God has to be made of material substances, and no material substance can last forever. So your God will die. Hmm. So if you say that God has a body, it is not possible. Because why? Because first of all, if God has a body, who made that body? Second. If you say as a body, the body must be either eternal or transient. It cannot be eternal because anything made of material has to be destroyed. And if if you say it is transient, then your God will also die. And Nayaika say, as now we have seen that Mimansakas raised the question that why did God create the world? If you say God created the world. Why did he do that? What motive? So Nayaika say that it is out of compassion. Out of compassion, God created the world. So Mimansaka say, before the world was created, there was nothing. So on whom did God have compassion? To show compassion, Kripa, there must be somebody. But before the world was created, there was nobody. <laughs> so on whom did God have compassion to create the world? There were no creatures prior to creation. For whom did God feel compassion? Hmm. And secondly, suppose if God had compassion, okay, I admit that God had compassion and he created the world. Now, suppose you have compassion on someone. Suppose we have compassion on someone. Shall we give him pain? Is it possible? We cannot give him pain. So if God created only out of compassion, why did he create so much suffering and pain? How they argue, you see. You say that God created out of compassion, out of mercy, kripa. So if you have compassion on something, on some, some, somebody, do you give him pain and suffering? So if God created the world out of compassion, why did he create this suffering? He should have created, if he is benevolent, he should have created a world which is all happiness and joy. There is no evil or suffering at all. So existence of evil is inconsistent with the benevolence of God. Hmm. So what type of God is he? If he cannot create and preserve a world free from evil. You say God is omnipotent, omniscient. Hmm. All powers he has, he can do anything. Could, could he not have created a world which is free from pain and suffering? Hmm. If he cannot do that, how is he omnipotent? Hmm. So, if he depends upon laws, if you say that no good and evil has to be there, it is a law. So if God is dependent upon any law, then how is he independent? Somebody is all powerful means what? There is no law which can bind him. Hmm. All these dictators, all these Hitlers and all those who are now, there is no law, law which can bind them. They can do anything in their countries. And they are doing. So, if God is a slave to any law, then how is he independent? How is he omnipotent? And next, next argument they give is that there is no evidence for there is no evidence for the reality of God's creativity or activity. See, when, whenever we propose something that accept something, what will we say? Give a proof. Is it not? You are telling something, why should I accept without a proof? Hmm. So if you say that there is a God who has created the world, hmm, <clears throat> there must be evidence for God's activity. If I say, if in a court, hmm, suppose there is a case going on against some person that 
he has robbed something so what will they do in a court they will ask if anybody has seen him doing that thing if there is no evidence then there is no proof so you say god created this world hmm. has anybody seen god creating the world bring someone who has seen hmm. if you can't there is no evidence for god's creativity no one can testify that yes i have seen god create the world the first creatures who were born if god created the world the first creatures who were born they did not know how they were born <clears throat> nobody is there to tell them and nor could they know the state of things prior to the creation of the world see if i am suppose i am the first person whom god created okay if i am the first person whom god created i did not see god create me i could not have seen hmm so this is one point and i also did not know what was there before i was created who is there to tell me hmm. so they say that god could not have created the world because all these reasons are there first what is the motive why should god create the world if god has some desire then that desire can only arise if the soul is joined with the organs so if you say that desire arose in god then god must have a body with the organs that follows from that argument if god has a body like ours that body either is eternal or transient there are only two options if you say that the god has a material body it cannot be eternal because everything is subject to destruction or origination in the universe so god will be destroyed hmm. and if it cannot be eternal and if it is transient then like us god will also die some day so both the ways it is impossible for god to have created the world and if you say god created out of compassion on whom did god have compassion before the creation of the world there was nobody there <coughs> and if you still say god created out of compassion then god should have created a happy world everybody should have been happy here why did he create so much misery and suffering if you say it is the law that good and happiness have to be together so if god is under law then what kind of god is he he is not omnipotent he is not independent at all and lastly there is no evidence for the reality of god's creative activity hmm nobody can say that i saw god creating the world nobody can say hmm so these arguments are there and of course they sound so convincing as i have told because you say yeah how can you deny that hmm. so there is a of course there is a lot of discussion about this but i have just uh, noted down the principal arguments so just we can uh, see a glimpse into the mind of the atheist those who do not believe in god so now we should remember that the original sutras and the original commentary does not refer to god but prabhakara and mima kumarila bhatta they bring all these arguments again the against the existence of god hmm they deny the existence of god they say that the law of karma is everything so one step there was a change later the concept of god also was brought in they changed so much that later mimansakas they said that yes there is a god who is the supervisor of the law of karma so 
actually the first book which we read when any beginner no wants to know about the mimamsa philosophy the first book generally which he reads is called that book is called artha sangraha primary and if want someone wants to study nyaya the first book which one studies is tarka sangraha they are supposed to be the beginners book but they are also very very difficult it's very difficult both the books so artha sangraha which is supposed to be a primary of mimamsaka's philosophy they say that there is a god and he is the supervisor of the law of karma so there is so much change through all these years original sutras original commentary don't even mention god prabhakara and kumarila bhatta they deny the existence of god they say that the law of karma is everything but later writers they admit the existence of god they say god is the chetan shakti that supervisor which governs all the law of karma hmm. so this is a very short view of the epistemology of the mimamsakas their views on soul their views on what is liberation their views on what is god if there is a god at all so there is a lot of detailed discussion in all all these spheres but uh, there is no that is of no practical use to us that is why in these four discussions we have only discussed uh, the bare minimum so that we have an idea and one of the most important things which we discussed was the theory of self validity of knowledge swata pramanya vada that is very important a cornerstone of the vedanta philosophy we have already discussed that so now just as an overview i will just share some photographs with you so here you can see <clears throat> so what are the most important concepts of this philosophy first of all that vedas are a purusheya vedas were revealed they were never created hmm. they were revealed to rishis not even god created the vedas this vedanta accepts mind you this vedanta also accepts and dharma is following the vedas shruti shruti is vedas vedas has many names vedas is uh, called by many other names so we should remember this vedas are also called shruti hmm vedas are also called agamas so these words will come up so we should remember so what is dharma according to mimamsaka according to mimamsaka dharma is following the dictates of the vedas hmm. and performing vedic rituals and of course god is not the creator or destroyer of the world and it is a pluralistic realistic philosophy which accepts the world and individual souls to be real as you can see there and it admits the law of karma and also it has its views on liberation heaven and hell which we have discussed so next is what are the sources of knowledge six sources of knowledge are admitted by the mimamsakas like vedanta perception inference verbal testimony comparison implication and non apprehension so all these 
these come under epistemology they all require a very detailed discussion so we can have that maybe sometime later and then the most important pramana method of knowledge which they admit is vedic testimony hmm. that is the most important because dharma can only be known from the vedas it is not something physical hmm. which you can see in any shop or something or go or somewhere and get that no hmm. dharma is not a physical something existent so it can be known only by by the vedas only it can be known not through our sense organs hmm. all the other pramanas perception inference etc cannot know dharma because all those are actually dependent on perception only finally the knowledge of dharma can only be derived from the vedas that is the most important thing and then this verbal cognition hmm what is verbal cognition or shabda pramana first of all we should to know that it is the cognition of something which is not grasped by our sense organ otherwise we need not need verbal verbal we don't need verbal cognition hmm so just go and see something that's all but if we cannot see something through our organs then we have to hear about it that is why vedas tell us about dharma which cannot be seen hmm so when verbal cognition is admitted it has to be uh the source is either through trustworthy persons or through the vedas if you get from some trustworthy person it is okay but if it is got from the vedas then no other proof is necessary the knowledge of the vedas is self valid hmm <clears throat> what is dharma dharma is the essence of right living hmm. scheme of right living it is a it is following the injunctions of the vedas just follow what the vedas tell you that is dharma that is the thing and if you do that you will go to heaven if you don't do that then it will be a dharma and you will suffer in consequence simple obey the vedas obey the scriptures and you are on the right track that is the thing so this is in short what we have discussed and of course the bulk of the mimamsa philosophy is two things first of all analyzing the sentences of the vedas when they analyze the sacrifice so what sacrifice there are many details given in the vedas hmm get this thing put this thing there give the oblations in this way so about those injunctions there is a lot of doubt that what sometimes there is confusion so mimamsakas tell us how to interpret those vedic commands properly so the bulk of the jemini sutras is what is just the description of those sacrifices and how the vedic sentences connected to those sacrifices are to be interpreted this we have to remember because their aim is only one to convince us that vedas are the only source of dharma and vedas teach us only one thing that is action karma sacrifice in or rituals etc that is the aim for that to justify their aim they give all this philosophy but the main part is description of those sacrifices and interpretation of the vedic sentences connected with those sacrifices that is all so in this age when vedic sacrifices are practically not performed at all hmm the major part of the philosophy of mimamsa has no practical use hmm. this we should 
remember. So let us stop here. Uh, you will be glad to know that this is the final discussion on Mimansa. So no more headaches for one or two weeks. Uh, next next the Saturday we will be celebrating Shivaratri. So let us stop here for today. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri 